Good evening, everyone. My name is Dominic Margaglione. I'm the pastoral associate at St. Michael Parish, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual Advent Mission Night for Radiant Dawn. And that title actually comes from something called the O Antiphons, which are a part of the church's prayer in these final days of Advent, starting on December 17th through the 23rd. And you may be familiar with the O Antiphons, and that's wonderful. If so, we're going to go deeper. And you may be thinking to yourself, I've never heard of the O Antiphons. And that's all right, as we will learn much more about them tonight. They're an ancient part. Uh, an ancient prayer, part of a church's tradition since uh, the 8th century, if not even before then. Um, and they're going to be a center part of the preaching, reflection, and prayer that we hear tonight. And with that, it's a joy to welcome Father Matthew Allman, who is a Redemptorist priest of the Baltimore province, but he's coming to us from his station uh, in the island nation of Dominica. Father Matt, it's such a, a pleasure to have you with us tonight and have you lead this mission night. Thanks so much, Dominic. It's great to be with you and uh, with the, the people of St. Michael's again. Yeah. yeah. And, and I will say, yes, we, you're uh, a familiar face in some regard that you came, I think it was about three and a half years ago to lead an in-person mission with us at Lent. And you actually kicked us off on the very first webinar mission night that we ever had back in May but I do have to say many people may not recognize you uh, without the beard. So I just want to make sure that they <laughs> it's know true. it's the same father, Matt Allman. I'm mixing it up. Yeah. <laughs> that is not uh, someone with the, with the same name. But uh, beard or sans beard, it's great to have you here. Thank you. And with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to uh, lead our prayer tonight. Great. Thanks very much, Dominic. So let me share my screen here. And we're going to begin simply with um, some music and song. I encourage you to feel free to, to, to listen and to sing along. Until the Son of God, I 
Sorry about that. Let me get back on the screen here with the sharing. to do this where I don't have the whole screen occupied. There we go. If you join me in praying the prayer for tonight's evening prayer for the church. Father of love, you made a new creation through Jesus Christ, your son. May his coming free us from sin and renew his life within us. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let me see if I can. I want to, I need to do this where I can both see my notes and share with you at the same time. So that's what I'm <laughs> trying to sort out. Had it going earlier. Now it's uh, giving me trouble. Um, one moment. But we'll do it like this for now. So several weeks ago, uh, if not a few months ago, uh, Dominic asked me about uh, joining you for this uh, Advent webinar, this kind of evening of prayer and reflection together. And we didn't really have a theme in mind. He, he simply kind of sent me a message and asked to do this. And I said, what are you looking for? And something Advent-y <laughs> was the, the basic idea. And um, he said, we can't do it in the first couple of weeks because we have some other things going on. So later part of week of Advent makes more sense. And so as I thought about it, I thought, well, later Advent, something Adventy, what, what could I reflect on? And the first thing that came to my mind and stayed there was the idea of sharing something with you tonight on the O ad antiphons. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, this might not be a topic that everybody is immediately familiar with. Uh, but I promise you, it is something that everybody in the Catholic Church has a connection with, uh, whether they're really aware of it or not. So what I want to do tonight is kind of explain some of it and tease out some of the pathways that you can travel for yourselves in prayer um, in the next week or so using the O antiphons. So when I talk about the O antiphons, what am I talking about? Um, let's start with the... Um, the idea of Advent before we get into the idea of the antiphons. So this season of Advent, um, Advent is something we all know. Uh, we're in the midst of this beautiful season of waiting, of waiting for the Lord with watchful anticipation. And we are um, experiencing this season of deep, rich colors, um, of candles burning brightly in the darkness, of hymns that we, we only hear at this special time of year. And Advent as a tradition has a, a few different focal points. Advent is always focused on the coming of the Lord. Uh, that's what Advent means, it means the coming. Um, but at the same time, the season shifts at different moments between focusing on different comings of the Lord. And sometimes we talk about all of them together all at once. Um, we speak of Christ's coming in the past at his nativity in Bethlehem. We speak of his coming in the present in all the ways that he is incarnate with us, even now in the word and in the sacraments and in our church and in our neighbors. And we speak of the way the Lord will come again at the end of time, bringing with him the fullness of the kingdom of God. None of these um, different paths of Christ's coming are ever totally out of the picture in Advent, but at different moments in Advent, we stress one more than another. We can say that as the season begins, there's a little more of the stress on the end of time coming of the Lord. And as the season ends, there's more of a stress on the coming in the nativity at Bethlehem. And a, a key moment of transition between these different focuses actually it happens this week on Thursday. Uh, December 17th is a day when all of our, our prayers in the liturgy um, through the church shift every year in Advent. We move at Mass from using the first preface of Advent to moves, move, using the second 
preface of Advent. And so when I say the preface, I mean that part of the Mass, kind of the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer, where the, Lord, the, the priest greets everybody, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. That prayer from there until the Holy Holy, that's the preface. And for Advent up until this, up through the 16th, that preface refers to two comings of Christ. But um, when we hit the 17th, the focus starts moving much more closely on the coming of Christ at Bethlehem in the Nativity. For the first time during the season, we actually start speaking of the Nativity. And we start pointing to the precursors of that. We mention the prophets, their anticipation. We, remember the, we mentioned the cry of John Baptist. We mentioned Mary um, longing for this birth of her son. So we, we have this shift that goes on in our Eucharistic prayer at Mass in the preface. But beyond the Mass, um, we get some other shifts in the public prayer of the church. We get a change in what we call um, the liturgy of the hours, the breviary. Now, some of you might be very familiar with the liturgy of the hours, but I know that many people in our church aren't. So I'm gonna take a little time and introduce that a little bit more uh, tonight as well. The liturgy of the hours is the um, public prayer of the church. It's the prayer of the church that we, we say throughout the day to make the day holy, right? It's the, it sanctifies the hours, we would say, because all around the globe, lay men and women, um, priests and religious, deacons and bishops, all set aside time to join in public prayer together, reciting the church's official morning prayer, uh, mid-morning prayer, midday prayer, mid-afternoon prayer, evening prayer, night prayer, and a special prayer that can be said at any time of the day, the, the liturgy of the hour, uh, the, the office of readings. I said. Um, and when people pray the liturgy of the hours, they join in a rhythm that's been going on for the better part of two millennia in the church, where the church, we would say, makes time holy uh, by reciting psalms, by singing hymns and canticles from the scriptures, by, by reading passages of the scriptures and offering petitions for the needs of the church and the world, right? Uh, in the course of four weeks, we work our way through all 150 psalms of the Psalter and bring in lots of other scripture too as we, we pray together. All ordained clergy in the church are bound by promises to pray the Liturgy of the Hours every day. And it is a regular feature of the religious life of many monastic communities and apostolic religious as well, that they take part in at least part of, if not the whole Liturgy of the Hours every day. Um, and there's loads of people who just pray it on their own. Um, some like to do the church's morning prayer. Some like to do the church's evening prayer. Some like the simplicity of our night prayer. And again, some do the whole thing. Probably the communities that are best known for praying the whole liturgy of the hours are our monastic communities throughout the world. I, I think of our, our Benedictine communities who have the motto of ora et labora, pray and, pray and work. Um, so throughout their day, they, they take time to stop and to um, set time aside to make the day holy by calling on the Lord's name and reflecting on the scriptures and the dynamics in, in their lives and in the world, right? So that's the, the liturgy of the hours. Well, on the, the 17th of December, things start to change in the Advent liturgy of the hours. Up until the 17th, the, the same verse begins every day's prayers. We call that verse the um, invitatory or invitatory antiphon. And from the first Sunday of Advent until the 16th, we say the same thing every day. Come worship the Lord, the King who is to come. Come worship the Lord, the King who is to come. We repeat that every day as we begin our prayer for the first season of Advent. Then on the 17th, we change it up a little bit to heighten the expectation. We start saying, the Lord is close at hand. Come, let us worship. He's close at hand. We're getting nearer to Nazareth. Then on the 24th, we'll move to today you will know that the Lord is coming and in the morning you will see his glory. And on the 25th, we'll say Christ is born for us. Come, let us adore him. He has arrived. Right? But the invitatory antiphon isn't the, the only part of the hours that I want to, isn't really the, the part of the hours I want to concentrate on tonight or the only thing that builds expectation in our liturgical prayers beginning on the 17th. The O antiphons actually do that in a special way. And that's what I wanna focus on. You see, in the church's evening prayer, 
a regular part of the celebration of evening prayer is the, the recitation, the, the reading or the singing of Mary's hymn from the visitation, Mary's Magnificat, where she proclaims, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. It's a wonderful hymn from Mary. And it is the gospel passage that we read at every evening prayer, every time we pray Vespers. And like for the gospel at Mass, we stand at attention for this proclamation. And as we do for the gospel at Mass, where we sing an Alleluia with a verse, before and after our recitation or our singing of the Magnificat, we have an antiphon that introduces it and concludes it. And the antiphons take on a particular character in this last week of Advent before Christmas Eve. Beginning on the 17th, all of the antiphons um, begin with the same word. They all begin with this proclamation, oh, oh. Uh, and we, we call on different people. It's a, a vocative, if you're into um, your grammar. It's a vocative O. Uh, we, we say O, and then we call on these different titles of the Lord. Um, we've actually been praying these uh, antiphons, these O antiphons, since about, as Dominic said at the beginning, at least the eighth or ninth century of our church. So we've had a long time for these particular prayers to kind of echo in our consciousness. As I said, each one begins with this word O, oh, and that's where we get this idea. Each of them um, focus on a different than image or title for Christ. Um, and those images and titles for Christ are nearly all drawn from the prophecies of the prophet Isaiah. And they are actually echoed in other passages of scripture as well. So we call on the Lord with these special titles drawn from the prophets and the scriptures, and then we ask the Lord to come in each one. We say, come, and we, we ask the Lord to do things when he comes. Daily, they offer us um, new images, scriptural images for Christ, and then with their repeated cries for Christ come to us, they keep heightening our expectation, deepening our longing for the arrival of the one they, that they proclaim. So let me show you the antiphons as the church uh, proclaims them. Let's see if I can go to the whole screen here. So we begin on December 17th. O wisdom, O holy word of God, you govern all creation with your strong yet gentle care. Come and show your people the way to salvation. Right? I hope you've, you've heard those titles before. Um, you ever listened to Handel's Messiah? You know these verses. Uh, you, you hear this in the background. Uh, this is part of what we sing. O, o wisdom. Uh, we have the book of wisdom. We have this uh, Christ as the wisdom of God, the wisdom which is there creating the world from the beginning and is now made incarnate in flesh in our Lord. December 18th, we turn and we look toward uh, the sacred Lord of Israel, the one who showed yourself to Moses at the burning bush, who gave him the holy law on Mount Sinai. Come, stretch out your mighty hand to set us free. We delve into the history of the people of Israel. And we, we reflect on the, the Lord's liberating action through, through the Exodus and the story of the redemption of the people of Israel. And we long for that redemption to be accomplished more fully for us in our day. Come, stretch out your mighty hand and set us free. On December 19th, we remember the lineage of our Lord, a root springing from the stump of Jesse. Um, Jesus is um, belonging to the, the line of the Davidic kings, the, the son of Jesse. So a flower of Jesse's stem, you've been raised up as a sign for all peoples. Kings stand silent in your presence. The nations bow down and worship before you. Come, let nothing keep you from coming to our aid. So we recognize, uh, we, before Advent, we celebrated the feast of Christ the King. We recognize Christ as the, the king in the lines of the David, the, the Messiah who has been longed for and hoped for. Uh, let nothing keep him from coming to our aid. Then we pray, O key of David, O royal power of Israel, come at your will to the gate of heaven. Come break down these prison walls of death. 
for all who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and lead your captive people into freedom, right? It's this wonderful image of Christ, the liberator, Christ who um, we'll say in our Easter liturgies is the one who harrows hell, um, who breaks through the powers of Satan, breaks down all those walls and sets us free. Right? So the one with the power of the keys to open up what holds us bonded. On the 21st, we, we turn to the title that is, gave this, uh, this evening reflection its title. O radiant dawn, splendor of eternal light, son of justice, come shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. We all know what it's like to, to live in darkness, to, to live without hope, to, to live wondering when, when the dawn's ever going to break again. So in this season, we, we call on Christ as our dawn, as the new day, as the one who makes possibility rise in our lives once more and leads us to life even beyond the darkness of the grave. So come, shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and give us hope, a radiant dawn. On December the 22nd, O King of all the nations, the only joy of every human heart, O keystone of the mighty arch of man, come and save the creature you fashioned from the dust. Again, uh, the, the kingly image here, but not just the king of Israel this time, the king of all the nations, the king of the world, the king who goes beyond just tribalism and brings all of us together as one family. Um, the image I, I grabbed for this one is actually from a church in Washington, D.C. It's uh, up in the apse of the church of St. Teresa of Avila Church in Anacostia, uh, Washington, D.C., traditionally black part of the city. I've always thought of it as their answer to the um, Aryan Jesus who's on display in the apse of the, uh, the National Shrine of the Basilica of the National Conception. They have this beautiful, blonde, powerful Jesus up there and tucked away in this other little church in, uh, in DC. We have this great uh, image of Christ the King in, with the African features. So I think it's a wonderful tribute um, to our God who is the God of all nations and all peoples. Then on the 23rd, we turn and we use the title that perhaps is the most famous for us in Advent. Uh, we call on our Emmanuel, the King and lawgiver, the desire of the nations, savior of all people, come. Set us free, Lord our God. Right? So Emmanuel, we know as prophecy from Isaiah, means God with us. I couldn't resist putting this picture in here. I, I don't know that this is one that Isaiah would have related to, but it's special to me as a redemptorist. This is actually a picture that was designed by our founder, St. Alphonsus, um, who loved the Christmas season, had a great devotion to the child Jesus. And this is the child Jesus as a fisherman who's fishing for human hearts. Uh, you see him with his little basket of hearts in the corner. He's scooping them out of the sea. Uh, this is the Emmanuel who has come to be with us so that he can capture our hearts. Uh, he is the desire of nations, whether we know it or not. He's the one that our hearts long for and will not be satisfied until they're one with him. Right? So these are our seven different antiphons. All right? um, we go through and have one each day. Uh, but there's something special about them that I want to show you that you don't really get the way we do them in English. You, we, we've always got to remember that we've only been praying in English for so long. And for centuries, these prayers would have all been prayed together in Latin. And something different gets revealed when we pray them in Latin. Not that I'm a Latin scholar or anything, or that I usually say my prayers in Latin. But this is a cool little thing about the antiphons that only shows up in the Latin. So I want to kind of take you a quick tour through that to show you. So each one of these titles, we want to be aware of what it is when we say it in Latin. So, O Wisdom is O Sapientia, right? O Wisdom, O Holy Word of God, uh, govern all creation with your strong, gentle care. That's how we start. We move to the sacred Lord of ancient Israel is O Adonai, uh, Adonai. This is the word that is used as Lord in the Bible as a substitute for the name of God so often. Um, this is the title that's used most often for the Lord, Adonai. We move to the next day, it's Radix, Radix Jesse, root of Jesse, a flower of Jesse's stem. Right? The, the key of David is O Clavis David, right? O Clavis, the key. The, the dawn, the radiant dawn, the rising sun, O Oriens, uh, the, 
the dawn, Oriens, or like Orient, rising in the east, Oriens. Um, the king is Rex, um, oh, Rex Gentium, king of the Gentiles, king of the nations. And Emmanuel, well, we use that the same way in both languages, so we know what Emmanuel is. I, I point those out because over the years, people have begun to say that they think that one of the things that's going on in these antiphons is that the monks were having fun who put these together, uh, that they actually created, in a sense, a, a hidden puzzle, a little word game that was going on in the liturgy. Uh, so people describe it as a monastic acrostic. So if you're familiar with an acrostic, usually you're solving a puzzle to get these words, and then certain letters from those words go together to make a final word, which is your grand solution to the puzzle. So in this case, we take the first word after the O in every one of the, the titles, O Sapienza, Adonai, Radix, Clavis, Oriens, Rex, Emmanuel, and that spells for us S-A-R-C-O-R-E. And if we turn that around, we get the words Ero Cross in Latin, which in Latin actually means tomorrow I will be. Tomorrow I will be here. Tomorrow I will be there. So many people claim that in the midst of these praying these antiphons, um, we're actually spelling out this kind of hidden message from the Lord who's building our anticipation and then answering the promise and saying, I'm going to be here tomorrow um, as we end, end these days. Whether that is absolutely true, uh, that that was intended, that's a, that's a matter of debate. Uh, there are many scholars who would say, no, that's not how the liturgy works. Um, we're not into hidden messages. Uh, we generally try to make things very explicit uh, and understandable in the liturgy. Uh, if it wasn't planned, it's a wonderfully happy coincidence, isn't it? It's a, it's a great little thing uh, to, to see and admire. So let me step back out of this for a second. So we have these prayers. If you um, pray the Liturgy of the Hours, of course, you're going to run into these prayers and you'll pray them each night. Um, but even if you don't pray the Liturgy of the Hours, um, you'll still run into these prayers. If you attend daily Mass, you'll actually run into these in the gospel verse in the Alleluia uh, before the gospel reading every day from the 17th to the 23rd. The only difference is that uh, they're in a different order uh, when we do them at mass than they are at evening prayer. Why exactly that is? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we reordered our, our lectionary in the 1960s after Vatican II, and when they put them together, somebody had the idea certainly that we wanted these O antiphons as our um, acclamations before the gospel, but uh, they didn't think enough to, to put them in the same order that they go in for evening prayer. Uh, again, scholars will debate, what happened? Uh, what, was, what were they thinking that they did this? But uh, they're not, and uh, you can get somebody with a higher big pay grade than mine to explain why that might, might be. But even so, we, we get the titles, and it also helps lend the idea that maybe having them in this order is not magical. Uh, the acrostic doesn't matter so much. It's more about the words themselves and the prayers themselves. Um, but of course, even if you're not saying evening prayer or you're, you're not going to mass each day during the final Advent days of Advent, there's still another place where most of us meet these antiphons regularly, right? It's in the classic Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I, many parishes have been singing that all through the season. Um, I think that many parishes actually uh, change their mass parts to use the tune from O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. They sing, they call it the Misa Emmanuel, so that this tune echoes all through Advent. Other places I know sometimes try not to use O Come, O Come, Emmanuel until the 17th. They try to save that uh, until these, these days of the antiphons come up, kind of trying to make an extra big deal out of it. Whatever you want to do. Um, it, it can all work. Uh, but still, we, we come in contact with this wonderful imagery and language and prayers in our singing of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And uh, that hymn that we sing, again, we tend to think of it as ancient. Um, it is and, and it isn't at the same time. Uh, the words, the antiphons are certainly ancient. As we said, we've been praying them since the 8th century. Uh, the tune that we sing them to 
is also quite ancient. Uh, it goes way back. It didn't start as a Christmas or Advent song. It actually was associated with a different part of the liturgy. But in the 1800s, around 1851 and then in 1861, we get our first evidence of these words and that tune, um, English words and that tune being put together in a hymnal. So for about 170 years now, uh, we've been singing them uh, with this tune, with this, with this rhythm, in this order, and they've become a, a wonderful part of our Advent traditions. So when you, you hear them now, I hope that uh, you'll get a sense of um, the wonderful imagery that's alive in these readings and know kind of a little bit more about what's bubbling underneath all of it. So what do we do with all this? Well, I find that um, as people pass through Advent, they're often looking for a little something extra. Uh, what, what more can we do to, to make this season holy? And particularly as we get close to Christmas, um, lots of people start taking on different stuff. Um, different cultures have a lot of different devotional practices that happen right before Christmas comes in. Lots of them concentrate on, in a sense, the novena before Christmas. Um, I know in Mexico, they engage in what they call the posadas, um, where people kind of travel from house to house, like Mary and Joseph searching for room in the inn, and they're refused at these various houses, and they move on to the next one, and they sing songs at each place, right? So that's the posadas. It's a wonderful devotional tradition. In uh, in the Philippines, they have a tradition of evening masses throughout the nine days before Christmas. And then the Christmas Eve mass in the morning, they call it the Misa de Gallo, because the mass of the rooster early in the morning before the, the last one. But the other ones are all in the evening. They call them the Simbangabi masses in the Philippines. Um, in Puerto Rico, they, they have the Misas de Aguinaldo, again, early morning masses for the nine days before Christmas. And here where I am in Dominica, we have a Christmas novena that started this morning with people getting up early for a mass at 5.30 in the morning where we say extra prayers and psalms. And it's a wonderful tradition. But one of the things that I find about all of these is that most of them are these great devotional moments, but they're not actually connected with the liturgy. Um, people go to mass, but they are often saying prayers that don't have any real relationship with what's actually happening in the mass at that time. For instance, here we're doing this lovely Christmas novena, but every day of the novena has a different uh, theme, and none of those themes have anything to do with the prayers we're saying at mass. We, we're one day praying about repentance, another day about forgiveness, another day about power and patience and healing of memories. Uh, but none of them are, are really directly connected with the public prayer of the church. Whereas the themes of the O antiphons, they are, right? Each day in our liturgy, the church mines the scriptures for us. And it comes up with these wonderful evocative images, these titles for Christ. And then it proposes them to us for reflection for the seven days uh, before Christmas Eve. What does it mean for God to be our wisdom? What does it mean that he's our Lord, that he's our root, that he's our key, that he's our dawn, that he's our king, our Emmanuel, God with us? And when and where and how do we long for him? What are we longing for him to do? The, the antiphons tell us we're longing for him to show us the way to salvation, to stretch out his hand, to come to our aid, to break down the prison walls of death, to lead captive people to freedom, to save us and set us free. Those themes that we come across in the, in the antiphons, they are timeless. And the desires that they express, they set us up for the great celebration of Christmas when we recognize the coming of the Lord our God in history, in the flesh, to do what he promised, and that is to begin the process of salvation that will be realized fully in his second coming. So this year, I, I'm hoping that with this kind of brief introduction, you might, uh, in this coming week, starting Thursday, give the O antiphons uh, a little space and attention in uh, your your clothes of Advent. I, I pray that you'll listen for them and watch for them and pray them and that they can lead you into deeper contact with the, the one who's coming, they anticipate. And now to kind of
conclude the reflection, what I want to do with you is kind of just share a, a personal story from Advent stuff for me um, and some music that's special to me. Back when I was a, a seminarian, um, my second year, third year of the seminary, uh, I got a pastoral assignment to a parish in Washington, D.C. called um, St. Martin of Tours Parish. And St. Martin's is a wonderful um, parish. And at the time, they had a magnificent gospel choir. Um, I believe they still do. I just haven't been there in a little while. Um, and they also, within this choir, they had some members who were a part of a professional group called Robert's Revival. And Robert's Revival was a group put together by the Catholic uh, gospel musician, um, Leon Roberts, Leon C. Roberts. Uh, Leon Roberts was a, a huge figure for the Black Catholic uh, musical world because he was one of the defining people for putting together the Lead Me, Guide Me hymnal. And coming out of um, a Protestant background himself with a rich gospel music tradition and having converted to Catholicism, he did a wonderful uh, ministry in the church of bringing the gospel tradition into contact with the Catholic liturgical tradition and melding these things together. And he had this group who would uh, he would work with and that would sing many of his songs and who he composed for often. And they used to give a Christmas concert, an Advent concert every year at St. Martin's as a thank you for letting them use the practice space at the church. And over the years, he slowly composed new pieces for this convent, new Advent pieces every year. And in the end, he had actually written a whole mass, um, a setting of the mass with hymns and mass parts and such, all based on Advent themes, which he ended up titling The Coming. And his group, Robert's Revival, recorded that. And pretty much the year after they recorded it, before it really got premiered anywhere and anybody sang it all together as one mass, uh, Mr. Roberts died rather suddenly. Um, so as a tribute to him on the next Advent, the, the choir at St. Martin's, the music director who'd been part of Robert's revival said, why don't we get together a big mass choir and uh, put on the coming? So they put out the word to choirs from all over Washington, DC um, to come be a part of this. And they advertised week after week at St. Martin's where I was working. and. When they advertise enough and ask anybody who wants to participate to participate, I'll sign up. So I joined the, the gospel choir for this and I ended up singing in the, the performance of The Coming, which actually turned out to be one of the most wonderful Advent experiences I've ever had. Um, just a, a great way of entering into the season and embracing the richness of the traditions that are a part of it in a whole new way and a whole different key. So what I thought I'd do with you tonight is just share um, the first two moments of that piece, uh, that, that mass, the coming. Um, I warn you, it'll begin with chaos. Uh, it'll begin with noise. Um, and that's the whole idea. Uh, because in our world right now, uh, things are tough. Uh, we are living in crazy times, uh, hard times, and with much suffering around the world. And we are here in this darkness, in this noise, in this difficulty, longing for the one who can save us to come. Right? And so with that, I will share with you uh, the first two moments of the coming.
death and destruction Brothers killing brothers, making money hustling We're supposed to be children of God But it seems like the devil's taking that to another level What's the light?
with that, I'll conclude my presentation. I hope that uh, you have a truly blessed rest of the Advent season and that you experience a deep longing for the presence of the Lord that may be satisfied in his coming. Amen. Well, on behalf of uh, St. Michael's, thank you so much, Father Matt, from uh, uh, staying up a little later with us, actually an hour later there too, uh, <laughs> to bring us this, this thought-provoking presentation. I, I have to say, as you went through this, the St. Uh, Augustine phrase uh, from the Confessions kept coming to mind, O oh, beauty ever ancient, ever new. How, as you said, these themes are so ancient and deeply scriptural and part of our, our faith history, and yet they speak to us really now in our world of COVID, in our world of violence and, um, and racism and anger. And, and I feel like that really came out as we think about the music, the art that this has inspired ever ancient coming from Gregorian chant to what you just shared with us in the, in the newer gospel tradition. And so I, I think it really speaks to us that the O antiphons are a great, great way that we can connect with our history as people of faith and, and the, uh, you know, in the Jewish faith and deep within the church and the monastics with their little acrostic games. But at the same time, it's really speaking to our present longing for Jesus to come right now and, and set us free and, and stretch out that hand. So, so thank you for that. Pleasure. Thank you. Great to have the opportunity to share with you. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us this evening. I look forward to uh, seeing you in these remaining days of Advent as uh, we, we uh, hear these antiphons at Mass and, and pray them at the Liturgy of the Hours. And, you know, Liturgy of the Hours have become so accessible, you can even get them on your phone as an app now. You don't have to get the four-volume set of, of breviary. So maybe this is a great introduction to, to dive into that evening prayer or even families. Just saying one of the uh, antiphons as you light your Advent uh, wreath um, before dinner or, or sometime in the day is a great way to enter into these ancient and, and new prayers. So thank you, Father Matt. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Have a great night, everybody. God bless. Bye.